Let's start this again. Everyone ready? Mm. Yeah. Let's try not to disconnect this time. To suddenly die. Yeah, let's not let's not die, people. Begin in three, two, one. On your tail, yellow dreams of peace by friendly AC. Chapter two. Looking for lore. Clover pulled out his phone and set directions for the library. Then he began walking towards it while following the directions on his digital map. A while later, Clover finally made it to the library. He checked the time on his phone and saw it was 4.25. Alright, looks like I'm on time. Just gotta wait for Rena now. Clover said to himself as he waited by the entrance. Several minutes later, Clover still stood at the library entrance, looking at his phone. Uh, of course she's late. You're supposed to be at 4.30 and it's 4.48. A few seconds later, Clover could see Rena running up to him. Clover had a smug smile on his face as she approached him. There you are, Rena. Kept me waiting a bit. Rena stopped in front of Clover and caught her breath. Oh, sorry I'm late. Piano lessons are such a hassle, as usual. My teacher's so rude. Clover winked at her. Hey, don't sweat it. We still got plenty of time. Rena smiled back at him. Uh, all right. So I guess we should head inside now, huh? Clover nodded as he smiled back at her. Yep, let's go. The two of them quietly entered the library. Rena leaned closer to Clover as she spoke quietly to him. So, for our class project, we need to find the history section. Lower nodded as he looked up at the second floor of the library. Yeah, it should be right up those stairs. They walked up the stairs and headed to the history section. So, what do we need to do for our report again? Rena asked. Clover thought for a moment before responding. Uh, um, j just something about monster history. Then we gotta research and write a paper on it. Rena had a powerful expression. Oh, that sounds boring. Clover sighed. <sighs> yeah, but at least it ain't complicated. Well, let's get searching. The two of them began skimming through the shelves. Clover looked through one area of the shelves, while Rena was a few feet away from him, scanning another section. Rena looked carefully through the array of books in front of her. Hmm, let's see here. Civil War history, World War II history, Cold War history? Jesus Christ. Rena shook her head in annoyance. Gosh, humans have so many wars. Sounds like a bit of a skill issue, am I right? Meanwhile, Clover was a few feet away, looking at books in front of him. Hmm. Where is it? Then Clover spotted a certain book before picking it up off the shelf. Ah! Hey, psst, Rena, come here. I found something. Rena looked over at Clover and walked towards him. Wait, you actually found something helpful? Mm-hmm. Take, take a look. Clover said as he held up a book with the title, History and Myths About Earth's Two Races. Rena smiled in satisfaction as she looked at the book. Oh yeah, that does look like a good one. And it was published really recently as well. Clover held the book in his arm. Well, let's go find a table and read it. Clover and Rena sat down at a nearby table as Clover put the book down. Well, let's take our notebooks out and take some notes. Rena suggested as she opened her bag. Right. 
but were opened his bag as well. Two of them reached into their bags and pulled out notebooks and pencils. They put the materials on the table and opened the notebooks as well as the book. Clover finished setting things up. Alright, we're ready to begin. Rina held the book in front of her. Hey, scooch closer to me so you can see the book better. Clover had a mischievous smile on his face. Sure thing. Clover scooched very close to Rena, causing her to blush a bit. Ah, uh, Clover. <laughs> that's, that's pretty close. Clover smirked. Yeah, and? Rena looked at Clover with a smug smile. Oh gosh, you're such a goofball. And cute. Clover smiled nervously as she blushed a little as well. Yeah, anyway, let's not waste any more time. Right, yeah, let's read. Rina said as she and Clover began reading the book. Chapter 1, The Discovery of Monsters. In the year 2014, a group of five human explorers wandered far from human civilization to explore a forest that they thought was never to have been fully explored by anyone. During this exploration, those five humans came across a thriving monster civilization that was completely hidden to the rest of humanity. Upon their arrival, many of the monsters were confused and puzzled at the humans' appearances. The explorers were scared and cautious at first, but President Anderson, the current monster leader, welcomed the humans with open arms and reassured them that they were safe. Anderson quickly befriended the five humans as they got to know more about monsters and their way of life. The explorers were a stack of discovered proof of existence of monsters before anyone else. A few days later, the humans had to leave, now gaining tons of data and information. They promised to spread the good word of monster kind to the rest of humanity and advocate for their right to live in peace. Weeks later, a letter was sent to the monsters from many human officials looking to negotiate and to get to know more about the monsters. Needless to say, the monsters were more than happy to cooperate. President Anderson, along with a few other monster officials, left the monster city for the first time in centuries to meet with the humans. Negotiations went rather smoothly as both sides easily came to an agreement. The deal was that monsters would be allowed to remain living in the area in the peaceful condition that no monsters are allowed to leave. In exchange, the monsters of civilizations will be given full protection from any malicious humans wanting to attack them. Seeing as this would barely change anything, Anderson agreed to the deal. Things would remain the same for a long time. For a long time, humans were forbidden from ever going near the monster city. However, as time went on, the humans began to get more comfortable with the monsters. So much so, in fact, their efforts to integrate monsters into human society and vice versa began. During the culmination of widespread supporting activism, the Human Monster Integration Act was passed in the year 2029, 15 years after monsters were first discovered. This act said that humans would be able to live in the monster city and monsters would be able to live in the neighboring human area. Along with this, monsters were fully given all the same rights as humans. Due to incoming waves of humans preparing to serve monsters, President Anderson decided to expand the city significantly to make space for the new residents, as well as establishing a few colonies with permission from human officials. One of these colonies being near Mount Ebbett, a place that will be discussed later on. Of course, the issue of soul absorption was a concern. The act made it fully illegal for a monster to observe a human soul under any circumstance. It seemed that simply outlawing it wouldn't be enough. However, it was been found that observed unknowingly the absorbed soul can rebel. Due to this incompatibility, the person who absorbed the soul is heavily weakened. Because this human monster is just, just, no, past the same. Shortly after this act was passed, a large group of humans began moving to the monster city. After seeing how the town looked, being especially drawn to the natural kindness and curiosity of monsters. On the other hand, most monsters decided to stay inside their city, while some moved to nearby human cities for business opportunities. Since then, humans and monsters have lived together in peace, with little to no accident.
You want me to read chapter two and three? No, I, I just need to catch your breath for a second. Chapter two, evolution of monsters. As monsters made more and more contact with humans, the properties of their souls began changing. Perhaps due to the sudden increase of exposure of human souls and the consumption of human food led to this change. It is known that human souls have an abundance of this substance known as determination. This allows a human soul to persist indefinitely after the host body has died. Monsters, however, have little to no determinations due to their bodies having little to no physical matter to handle said determination. But the sudden increase in exposure of humans led many monsters to have an increase in determination within their souls. Initially, when a monster dies and turns to dust, their soul breaks immediately. In the case of these new, evolved monsters, their souls are able to persist for a few minutes after death. This is probably the case for boss monster souls, which are able to persist for a few seconds, but now the time has been extended to almost an hour. In addition to that, monster souls began getting a colored outline along their white souls. These colors are the same six color varieties that human souls have. Now monsters have the same trait assignments as humans do, if to an extent. This evolution also led to magic abilities of monsters drastically increasing as well. Chapter 3. The Rumored War Till 20 years ago, humans and monsters lived separately, blissfully unaware of the other race's presence. It was thought to always be this way, but there's a certain myth that humans and monsters have lived together in peace a very long time ago. The myth states that hundreds of years ago, a great war broke out between our two races. After a long battle, the humans were ripped and sealed the remaining monsters underground in what is now known as Mount Ebbet using a magic spell. Since this has happened centuries ago, there are little records and evidence of this war occurring. Still, this myth was widely believed by much of humanity for a time. That is, the discovery of this monster civilization on the surface 20 years ago called this myth into question. Many speculated that perhaps the event of that myth weren't so accurate. Maybe there was a war, but the monsters just retreated to a hidden area instead of being sealed underground. Other theorists suggest the war never happened to begin with. When asked of this myth, Anderson, the current monster leader, also had little to no knowledge of this myth. This is plausible, as all humans and monsters that were alive at that supposed time have long been dead, as long as their new descendants. Either this myth is false, or the information regarding it has been lost to time. However, a certain incident is rumored to have occurred around 80 years ago. It happened in a small village near Mount Ebbet, the place where monsters were rumored to be sealed. A large goat monster was seen in the village, carrying the dead body of a child. The people of this village saw the monster and believed the monster was the one to have killed the child. The humans attacked this monster, but strangely, the monster didn't fight back, instead walking away. It is said that few villagers actually got a good look at the monster, and many weren't sure if it was actually a monster carrying that dead child's body. And as for this occurrence, none of the monsters had any remembrance of such a monster ever existing, nor any human that came in contact with them before the discovery 20 years ago. In addition to this, several disappearances have occurred at Mount Ebbet after the supposed incident across varying intervals involving five children, the most recent of which being a girl named Melody Gray, who went missing near the mountain two years ago. It is rumored that all five of these children had fallen into the underground beneath the mountain, the same place in which those supposed monsters were sealed. As none of the child's bodies were ever... To conclude, most of the information discussed here is purely speculatory, and is no way entirely accurate. However, these myths and rumors do shed some light on the confusing history between humans and monsters. Lower side as he and Rena finish reading the first ten chapters. Phew, this is a lot of info. At least we got a bunch of notes. Rena nodded as she closed the book. Yeah, I think that's a good place to stop for now. Let's go to the librarian and borrow it. Clover and Rena packed up their things before heading to the librarian to borrow the book. After doing that, the two of them left the library to notice it was starting to get dark out. Clover checked his phone. Oh wow, it's 6.32. Guess we lost track of time, huh? Rena patted her stomach. Yeah, I'm feeling kind of hungry. Clover thought for a moment before an idea came to him. Well, 
There is a nice cafe around here. How, how about you and I have dinner there? You know, blush, this clover suggested this. You, you mean like a date? Clover scratched the back of his head as he smiled nervously. Eh, sort of. We're just going to a casual cafe to eat some dinner. So you good with that? Rina smiled as she nodded at Clover. That's a date, Clover. But that sounds nice. I'll text my mom that I'm gonna be late. Yeah, I'll do that too. Clover said as he turned on his phone. After the two of them messaged their parents, they began heading to the cafe. Eventually, they made it there alive. Entering inside, they saw the place was rather busy. Hey, Clover! Clover looked around the table to see who called his name when he saw his brother, Rose, sitting at one of the tables next to his girlfriend, Casey. Clover smiled in excitement as he saw his brother. Rose? Clover and Rena went over to the table. N nice luck seeing you two here. Rose said as he playfully winked at them. Rena nodded in agreement as she smiled back at him. One sec, there we go. Ah, there we go. Yeah, me and Clover were hanging out at the library, so we thought we'd come here to get some food. She pointed at two empty seats at the table. Well, you two can join us. Because silly Rose here offered way more, or ordered way more food than we needed. Rose <laughs> chuckled. <laughs> yeah, that was my bad. But hey, at least you two don't have to wait 30 minutes. Clover smiled widely as he and Rena sat down. Thanks, bro. The four of them began eating the variety of food at the table. So, uh, how's college going for you two? Rena asked. Oh, it's going great. Me and Rose adjusted pretty quickly since we got our own apartment. DC responded as she swallowed her food. Yeah, and our classes haven't been too bad so far. Casey here helped me out a lot though. She's definitely smarter than she looks. Hey, what do you mean smarter than I look? DC said as she playfully pinched Rose's cheek. Nothing, nothing. Love you, Casey. Rose responded with a smirk on his face. Clover chuckled. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear you two are doing well. It's been a while since we've seen each other. Casey took a sip from her drink. Well, our fall term is going to end pretty soon. That'll give us a few days to meet up and do something fun. Rena smiled excitedly as she ate her food. Oh, I can't wait then. Hey, maybe... We could even go on a double date. Rose finished eating his food. Now that sounds like a plan. Over finished eating his food as well. Phew, that really satisfied my hunger. Rena nodded as she took her last bite. You said it, cutie. Casey picked up the empty tray. Well, looks like we're all done. Rose stood up during his train. We already paid the bill, so let's just throw our trash out and get out of here. The four of them threw their trash out and left the restaurant. Rose looked at his phone. It's getting late. Well, me and Casey best be heading back home now. Casey waved at Clover and Rena as she and Rose began walking away. We'll see you too soon. Clover waved back. See ya. Good luck, Rose. You too, Clover. Rose responded. Hi, guys. Rena said as she waved back at Casey. Rena turned back to look at Clover. Well, that sure was a nice call to go here, huh? 
Oscar had a smug smile on his face. <laughs> no need to thank me. Anyways, we should head home now. Rina looked up at the sky, which was almost completely dark. Yeah, I guess we should. Come on, Clover. Clover and Rena began walking home. As they were walking down the sidewalk, Clover noticed a piece of paper on a traffic pole next to them. The word missing in large text at the top caught his attention. He stopped to take a closer look at the poster. Then his eyes widened as he noticed it. Hey, hey Rena, come, come look at this. Rena turned around and walked back to Clover. What is it? Clover pointed at the missing poster. This missing poster here, it, it's for the five missing children we heard about that book we read. Rena frowned as she looked at the poster. Oh, yeah. I nearly forgot about them. Clover looked back at the poster, reading more details on it. He looked down slightly as this reality dawned on him. Those kids are still out there, missing. Someone has to help them. And if they're dead, someone has to at least find their bodies, or their souls. Clover thought to himself as he looked at Mount Ebbett in the distance. Are you alright, Clover? Rena asked, concerned. Clover slowly nodded. Y yeah, I'm fine. L let's keep going. As Rena turned back to keep walking, Clover removed the poster from the traffic pole and folded it to put in his pocket. Then he continued walking home with Rena. Soon enough, they made it back to their neighborhood. Their homes were only a few houses apart, so they stopped in front of Clover's house. Clover looked at his house. Well, this must stop. I'll see you tomorrow, Rena. Alright, I'll see you, Clover. Take care. Rena responded as she gave Clover a quick peck on the cheek. Clover blushed a little as he saw her walk away towards her own house. He smiled as he walked towards his house. After inputting the code, he walked inside when he saw his mom and dad eating dinner. Clover's dad looked back at him. So, how was your little date with Rena, son? Clover smiled nervously as he laughed. Well, we we're, we're mostly just standing at the library, although we did run into Rose and his girlfriend at the cafe. Clover's mom looked a bit surprised. Oh, really? Well, I hope she's doing well. And your girlfriend too, after her transition. Don't. Clover nodded. Oh, he is. Anyway, I might have an actual date with Rena tomorrow. But man, I'm really tired. Then you should get to sleep early. You'll need the extra sleep after staying up last night. Oh, and son, I know I haven't been the greatest dad. I keep yelling at you about your lamp instead of just fixing it myself. But I just wanted to say how proud I am of you supporting your girlfriend through her trans- SHUT UP, DAD! No. Clover's dad said as he walked away from the table. Clover smiled tiredly. Yeah, well, I'm heading off to my room then. Sister? Good night, Cola. Clover's mom said as she smiled at him. Good night. Clover responded as he made his way to the room. Clover entered his room again and took off his cowboy hat, bemoaning the fact that his parents kept mentioning his friend transitioning. She's he not. He took out the folded missing poster in his pocket. He stared at it for a moment before putting it on his desk. After switching into his pajamas, Clover turned off the light, hopped on his bed, making sure to move over the hanging lamp to prevent this morning's incident from happening again. Then he hopped into bed and closed his eyes before drifting off to sleep, not noticing the lamp moving back. Oh no. <laughs> Hell yeah. He's gonna get whacked by that fucking <laughs> lamp. Shit. <laughs> it's gonna hurt. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
But uh, Rina will be trans from now on. That word's not even in the chapter anymore. <laughs> I don't care. She's now. trans now. She's my character. I can I can make her, I can make her god if I want to. You can make her god. Not anymore. That would not be We've good taken writing. this character from you. It's our character now. Communism. Yes. No. Oh. Communism. Or cannibalism. Who knows? It's way it's the what? same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna dope out your clover. Yeah. Oh come on. I don't think you should be happy about this. Alright, <laughs> uh, who's next? Well, that would be Ada's me and Prophet. Okay. And the gift for me, the greatest Thester of all Thesters. Alright, let me stop this recording.